You could turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to continue uh, our journey through the book of Hebrews. Tonight uh, we're going to be uh, giving a more brief time in the Word so that we have some time following the, the uh, teaching to wait on the Lord and to uh, pray together, which is always such a, a beautiful thing. But if you've been with us in our study in the book of Hebrews, you know that the book of Hebrews, first of all, to bring you up to speed, is just as advertised, written to a Jewish audience, written to a community of Jewish uh, individuals that really fell into three groups. This will really help you navigate through the book of Hebrews and not get hung up on some of the shoals that sometimes uh, people can encounter in this book. When we understand that, first of all, it was written to Jewish believers, those who had wholeheartedly received Jesus as the promised Messiah. But also in that particular community, there were those who were open to the idea of Jesus being the Messiah, but were not yet committed to that idea. They were like, well, you know, we'll take that under consideration, not flat out rejecting Jesus claimed to be the Messiah, but not really willing to go all in. And then there were those who were flat out opposed, uh, just uh, weren't buying it. Uh, The idea that uh, they still had their temple rituals, they still had their sacrifices, they wanted to put their faith and trust in the old covenant rather than in this idea of a new relationship with God. And so uh, the writer of Hebrews, it's uh, an interesting thing. We've talked about the fact that there are all kinds of different theories out there as to who uh, wrote Hebrews. Uh, Probably the prevailing theory is that the Apostle Paul wrote it. The reason it's different a bit in format than the other uh, letters of the Apostle Paul is uh, because it was uh, written not to a Gentile audience, but to a Jewish audience. And so uh, Paul, putting on his Rabbi Saul hat, Uh, would communicate a bit differently. Uh, We discovered that there were individuals mentioned at the end of Hebrews that uh, were certainly uh, those who were close to Paul. And so no reason to dismiss that out of hand. Uh, Others might think that it was Apollos. He was an individual who was mighty in the Word and certainly well-schooled in teaching the Old Testament. Uh, There are a number of other theories. Priscilla and Aquila is one of them. But uh, for our purpose, uh, we'll probably... Uh, plant our flag on the idea that it was Paul writing to the Hebrews, having Luke, his uh, his uh, scribe, his historian, translate uh, his remarks probably from Aramaic or Hebrew into Greek, and that's why we see some of the language differences in style and so forth from the other letters that uh, that Paul wrote. But uh, the gist of Hebrews, as we have seen, is uh, first of all showing this group. Uh, this group made up these three parts with one unifying message. Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater, for instance, than the prophets. The prophets could tell you about God. Jesus could show you about God. He who has seen me has seen the Father. And uh, last week we entered into a, a very interesting discussion about how Jesus is greater than the angels. And that was a fascinating stretch of turf, especially during the first century when Paul was writing. Uh, You might recall, if you're familiar with the book of Colossians, how the Apostle Paul had to caution some people about buying into the idea of worship of angels. Uh, There were cult groups that said that you had to work your way up to God, and if you worship certain angels, they could introduce you to higher angels who eventually could lead you into a place where you could connect with God directly. And, uh, and so this idea of angels uh, not uh, necessarily being servants and pointing to the Lord, but being an end to themselves, uh, was certainly something that was prevalent in that day. And you know, we've gone through a few winds of doctrine, even in our day and age, where people became really obsessed about angels and had bumper stickers in the back of their car saying, never fly, uh, never drive faster than your angel can fly, and so forth. And so the writer of Hebrews has gone to great lengths to show us that Jesus is greater than the angels. For to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. In other words, Jesus has a greater relationship with the father than the angels could. He is the son of God, God the son. 
He is not one of the sons of God. That is an angel that has sort of a, a secondary relationship uh, with the Lord. But as we're going to see, it goes even deeper. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Uh, Jesus is referred to the firstborn, not in chronology. He isn't one who has a birth date, if you will. He has always been. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 says that Jesus' goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. The idea of the firstborn there is the idea of the one who has preeminence in the family of God, the one who has those rights of the firstborn. And when you study uh, even how the firstborn in the family, uh, as far as the Jewish culture was concerned, uh, when we see it demonstrated among the people of God, we never see the firstborn chronologically actually being the firstborn. It, it is always an individual that was found more worthy, for whatever reasons, to occupy that role. And it's to confirm that, let all the angels of God worship Him. won't be too long before we're going to be singing some of those wonderful Christmas carols that talk about uh, the angels worshiping the Lord at the time of His birth. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. We talk a little bit about the different natures of angels, far from being the chubby babies with the trumpets floating on by that we see in the Renaissance art. They are awesome and uh, amazing creatures. If we saw one, they would take our breath away. But to the sun, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. I love that. Who is the he being referred to here? God calls the Son God. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You've loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companion. Well, here we see why we believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. Because God not only calls His Son God, but He refers to the Son of God having a God. That is, in Jesus' incarnation, when He walked among us, as a man, he had his relationship with his heavenly father. And that answers a question that sometimes the cults will throw at you. If Jesus is God, why did he pray to God the Father? Well, he was also 100% man. Read through Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, about Jesus emptying himself of his privileges and prerogatives and taking on human nature. He was the perfect man, as well as 100% God. Those two natures were fused in Jesus, not confused. We need to understand that. If Jesus was the perfect man, we would expect him to have a perfect relationship with God. So why would it surprise us in the slightest to have Jesus praying to the Father? And notice he drives the point on even further. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. This is referring to Jesus. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. Now, notice uh, God the Father refers to Jesus by a very interesting name. The word Lord there, you'll notice in your New King James Bible, is all in capital letters. That means that the holy covenant name of God is being used here. The yod heth vow heth We would uh, pronounce it Jehovah or Yahweh. Uh, we're not really even sure how it was pronounced because the Jews considered it so sacred they didn't even put the vowels in. Now we're taking a guess as to how that was pronounced. But understand something. Jesus was given this name which is above all names. He is called Yahweh, Jehovah in this particular passage. His eternal nature is beautifully portrayed here. But to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Well, here we see where Jesus, the God-man, is right now, sitting at the right hand of God, not just kicking it, not just uh, sort of waiting for his cue to enter back into the realm of God's plan for his universe. We are told in the book of Romans chapter 8, that wonderful passage, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who will be against us? If he didn't spare his only son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not along with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? 
It is Christ Jesus who died, now follow me here, furthermore is risen, who is seated at the right hand of God, who will also make intercession for us. Maybe you've heard the old expression before, it's good to have friends in high places. You realize you've got the ultimate friend in a high place? Jesus is praying for you right now, interceding for you before his heavenly Father. Oh, but all the billions of people in the world, Scott, how could uh, God possibly have time to pray for me? Well, your God's too small, if that's what you're thinking. Jesus is eternal. He is so vast. He is uh, omnipresent, the scripture says. And because of that, he is great enough to hold every atom of every molecule in the universe together, great enough to keep the galaxies spinning, and certainly great enough to care for little old people like you and me. In fact, the very number of hairs on your head are all known and numbered by him. You know why? Because he loves you so much he can't take his eyes off you. So this beautiful picture of where Jesus is at the right hand of God, making intercession for us until that day when he comes to rule and reign. All right, the uh, recipients of this letter might say, okay, I see that Jesus is greater than the angels, so where do angels even fit in? Should they just be ignored? Well, the last line in this passage is really powerful. We'll spend a couple minutes going through this here tonight. Verse 14 says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. Now, the word ministering there, it sounds like a nice churchy kind of a word, doesn't it? But it literally means they are serving. They are God's servants. We can certainly buy that. But notice they are there to minister to us, to those who will inherit salvation which raises a very important question. What does that service, what does that ministry look like in practice? Well, because our time tonight is is somewhat limited, uh, we're going to uh, give you the Cliff Notes version of what angels are up to in our lives. You know, it was the great 20th century philosopher uh, Neil Young who said, hey, hey, my, my, more to life than meets the eye. Well, Neil had nothing on the Apostle Paul because in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, we are told that there really is more going on all around us all the time than you and I can possibly understand or possibly perceive with our five senses. In the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, Paul wrote, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes and strategies of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, inevitably, when I've heard this passage taught, people will start launching into what Satan is up to in this world. As we know, the scripture says that Satan is a fallen angel of great power. You can do your homework on this. Read through Isaiah chapter 14. Read through Ezekiel chapter 28, which speak about the fall of Satan and his status as an angel. Now, he was a mighty angel, to be sure. We might even call him one of the archangels, one of the head angels. Ezekiel chapter 28 seems to indicate that he was an angel that was in charge of heavenly worship at one time. But he fell in love with his own beauty. He became enamored of his own power. He felt like he could be God himself, and his pride led to his downfall. In Isaiah chapter 14, he makes five I will statements, culminating with the idea that I will ascend to the throne of God. God responds with one, no, you won't, and that's that. But Satan, although he's a defeated foe, he was completely and thoroughly defeated when Jesus rose from the dead, is a defeated foe in the same way that, uh, well, Nazi Germany was a defeated army as soon as the D-Day invasion was successful. It was all over but the shouting at that particular point, but there was still a lot of shouting going on. The Germans weren't going to go without a fight. And that's where we are right now. There is a spiritual battle that goes on. 
And again, a lot of times in these studies, people will go into great details about spiritual warfare with an emphasis on what Satan and his fallen angels are up to. We're told in Revelation chapter 12 that uh, the dragon dragged along with him a third of the stars of heaven. From that, we believe that one third of the angels followed Satan in his rebellion against God when he fell. Now, I'm very encouraged by that because it tells me that two-thirds of the angels didn't fall. Satan is outgunned two to one. God has two times, at least, the angels that uh, Satan has at his disposal to minister to his people. Now, the focus of this battle is what goes on in our hearts and in our lives. Satan knows he can't take God in a fair fight, So he goes against those whom God loves, and that is his people. And so we could ask ourselves the question, if Satan and his angels are about the business of scheming and strategizing and doing their best to trip us up, to nullify our effectiveness in this world, to get our eyes off the Lord, what is God up to? What are his angels up to? In our lives. What is this ministering of the ministering spirits all about? Well, real quickly, let me give you three things that angels are up to in this uh, world, how they minister to us. First of all, they minister to us by protecting us. Angels are there to protect us. And one of the most vivid passages that describe this protecting work is found in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 6. We are told the king of Syria had an intelligence problem he was trying to solve. Every time he would try to assault the nation of Israel, the northern ten tribes who were really all that interested in the things of God, by the way, it seemed like uh, they were one step ahead of his strategies, one step ahead of his schemes. So finally he called in his generals, his joint chiefs of staff, and said to them, all right, which one of you is the spy here? And one of them said, no, no, it's not us. It's Elijah, the prophet. He tells people, uh, Elisha, the prophet, he tells people uh, he knows exactly what you're even saying in your own bedroom, king. Well, the king decided to do something about that. He dispatched his special forces to go on a search and destroy mission to deal with Elisha once and for all. Uh, And word came to him that Elisha was at a place called Dothan. And uh, so in uh, uh, verse 14, of 2 Kings chapter 6, we read this account. He sent horses and chariots and a great army there, and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? But he answered, Do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Well, Elisha wasn't worried. He realized that there were more with him than those who were with the enemies of God. And as a result, a tremendous victory took place. New Testament, same thing we see going on there. Uh, God dispatches his angels to protect his people. You might recall uh, that uh, in Acts chapter 12, King Herod uh, found out that a great way to curry favor with the Jewish establishment was to kill an apostle. He had James, uh, the uh, brother of John, killed and uh, set out to have Simon Peter as his next victim. Peter was arrested and waiting his day of execution. We were told that constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church in Acts chapter 12. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. And guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city and it opened them of its own accord. And they went out 
and immediately went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. And Peter uh, came to himself. He said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered him from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So once again, we see angels getting involved, protecting God's people. And who knows how often these sort of things have happened to us. Uh, We get so locked into seeing things in the physical and the tangible, uh, we fail to realize uh, how much has been going on in the supernatural to protect us and to watch out for us. One thing I am definitely looking forward to is seeing the heavenly replay of my life, Uh, not just from what we can see with our eyes. I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. But all the times there was angelic warfare going on and that the power of God through his ministering servants prevailed not just for me, but for you as well. You know, if you've ever had one of those, woo, man, uh, that was a close one. Well, it was probably a close one because an angel probably pushed you out of harm's way or something along these lines. I, I love that because no matter how much man might scheme, no matter how powerful men might seem, God's armies are far greater than anything we'll see on earth. And with all the craziness going on with elections and so forth these days, that's a very good thing to keep in mind. So angels are there to protect us. They're also here, believe it or not, to direct us. We could show a number of Old Testament uh, incidents where angels told God's people where to go at a particular time. Uh, One of the most outstanding examples of this was found in Acts chapter 10. We are told there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment, a devout man, and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming to him and saying, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid. He said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do to be saved. And the angel who spoke to him departed. Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. And when he explained all these things, he sent them to Joppa. Well, here we see an individual whose heart was longing for a true relationship with God, had angelic intervention to bring him exactly to the place where he could get the information necessary to give his heart to the Lord. God had to also intervene in the heart of the source of the message of salvation. He had to get Peter on the program to be able to share the gospel with Gentiles. But suffice it to say, angels will provide us direction in where we need to go. Another great example of this is found in the book of Acts chapter 8 where Philip was having this gangbusters ministry among the people in Samaria. And suddenly an angel of the Lord said, go down to the road that leads through uh, Gaza, which is desert. And uh, that didn't make the least bit of sense, I bet, to a guy like Philip. Why would I leave this thriving ministry here and go down to this desert road? Well, lo and behold, there was a divine appointment there. An official of Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, was going through that area on a, a chariot. And he was prompted by the Holy Spirit to go up alongside the chariot and uh, see this man reading from the scroll of Isaiah, Isaiah 53. And uh, he said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, well, how can I if there's no one to instruct me? Tell me, was the prophet speaking to himself or someone else? And I'm sure Philip was like, oh, I I get it. I understand now you brought me out here. Well, that was angelic intervention. Sometimes angels will tell us exactly where to go where to be the other thing that angels do just real briefly they not only protect us they direct us but they also reflect god's glory that's what they're all about they're not interested in drawing attention to themselves they're interested in allowing us to have a better and fuller and more beautiful relationship with god boy four mighty angels and you can read about them in your own time in revelation chapter 4 We're told they are living creatures. They are, uh, as we see in the book of Ezekiel, as we're introduced to them, cherubim, a particular order of angels of great power and strength. They're described as being before the throne of the Lord. 
And one is described as looking like a man, the other like an ox, the other like a, an eagle, the other like a lion. Now, we ask ourselves the question, why does God create these beings with these kind of animal or, or physical attributes associated with them? Well, when you take a look at those characteristics, there are some who will associate these four living creatures with the four pictures of Jesus that we are given in the four Gospels, if you will. Again, in the, the book of Matthew, we see Jesus, for instance, portrayed as a sacrificial individual, one who was willing to lay down his life for the flock, hence the picture of one of them looking like an ox, a sacrificial animal. In the book of Luke, we see Jesus as the Son of Man, hence the angel who looked like a man represented there. In the Gospel of John, we see him as the Son of God who has come down from heaven, a beautiful picture of the eagle that is involved there. In Mark, he's the King of Kings. And so we see him represented as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. These angels covered with eyes, we are told, eyes in Scripture representing wisdom, if you will, are always there to declare and represent the glory of God. And as we worship, we are there to declare and represent the glory of God, not calling attention to ourselves, but focusing in on the true and living God. You know, uh, angels are interesting creatures. Uh, you know, if people ask the question, do you think we have an individual angel assigned to our case? Well, I think if you're someone like me, you've probably got more than one because I'm sure I'm, I'm more than a handful to keep on the right track. Uh, remember something, God's uh, hosts of heaven, they are called. It's a picture of a mighty, numerous army. He has more than enough angels involved to get his will done. And certainly, uh, we as believers are guided by the Holy Spirit. We are indwelt by the, the very Spirit of Jesus. We have a relationship with God the Father. But what a wonderful thing it is to know that these angels are here for a purpose, for a reason. Billy Graham had a great book out a few years ago called uh, Angels, God's Secret Agents. In a sense, that's what they are. You know, will you meet an angel in this life? Later on in the book of Hebrews, we're going to uh, be exhorted to show hospitality and kindness to strangers for some who've done so have entertained angels unaware who knows how many angel angelic encounters we've always had but a real genuine angelic encounter is probably going to be so subtle we're not going to even understand that it happens till we see the lord face to face but you know if you want to bless the angel or angels who are assigned to your case there's a beautiful passage in the book of revelation that shows us exactly where our priorities need to be. Uh, we're told in Revelation 19 that the Apostle John, who was so blown away by the revelations he was receiving about the glory of God, his angelic tour guide, if you will, through heavenly glory, said to him, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You want to bless your angel? Worship God. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's what angels are all about. And they're here to minister to you to give you everything you need to serve you in great ways and small ways, to keep you focused, to keep you right on track, to give you everything you need until you're safely home. Father, we thank you for your beautiful word, and we thank you, Lord, that even as we gather together for this time, even now as we move into this time of prayer and waiting on you, we thank you, Lord, that we are not alone as human beings, even in this sanctuary. It's just Beautiful that your word says in First Peter chapter 1 and verse 10 and following that our salvation is something that angels long to look into. It blows their minds, Lord, that you could be concerned about little finite creatures like us. And yet you are. Thank you, Lord, that your angels are perhaps even ministering to us right now in this place in ways we can't fully understand. But we know that when they do their job, and they do it well. 
The end result is our focusing our attention on you, the true and living God. Lord, I do pray that now as uh, we enter into a time of waiting on you and, uh, and worshiping you and even sharing prayer requests and even being able to move into times of spiritual gifts, we pray that the next few minutes that we have to do this would be honoring to you. We thank you, Lord, that angels are awesome, but you're even greater than that. And your Holy Spirit is here to minister to us personally with your power, O oh, true and living God. Help us to truly avail ourselves of this privilege and to enjoy this time in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.